Dave in trying to discern what lies beneath. How far can we dig to get the ultimate stuff of reality? A number of very serious scientists look to information, not to describe reality, but as the fundamental substance of reality. As a philosopher, how do you look at that? Well, I think it's a wonderful view because it's a metaphysics, it's a modern metaphysics for the information age. You know, years ago, the ancient Greek philosopher Thales said everything is water. Now, there's a metaphysical view. Okay, <laughs> that one didn't fly so well. Then uh, we moved into the modern era, and, and Newton said everything is atoms. Well, these is, everything is a quantum wave function. Everything is matter. And uh, along the way, someone like Berkeley said everything is mind. Well, now we have a new metaphysical view. Everything is information. It's all bits. Deep down, it's all bits. It from bit. Everything that exists ultimately comes from Brit. So it's a beautiful metaphysical view. Now we have to evaluate it and figure out whether it might be true. Yeah. yeah. Well, uh, well, how do we do that? Well, one thing is, you know, it's partly driven by the physics, right? You know, so can we, can we do a physics which is cast in purely informational, purely algorithmic terms? And, you know, I'm not an expert here, but my sense is people have been trying to do this. And so far, you know, some bits of physics cooperate, other bits of physics, not so well. On the other hand, we're not even close, I think, to the bottom level of physics yet. There's still too many mysteries to solve. And it could well be that the picture that integrates it all could ultimately be an informational one. Yeah, the, the question, of course, is, is, is the information something that represents reality? And as you extend your information out to more and more decimal points, you get closer and closer asymptotically to what reality will be, but never really be reality, because all you're doing is describing reality. It's like, uh, I don't know, more and more pixels in your digital camera represent, but you could be, it doesn't matter how many, you, you're not, your picture will never be the reality. Well, there's this really interesting question, you know, what is the ultimate nature of reality? Even physics is, is mathematical. It describes entities, it gives mathematical, numerical characterizations of them, how they relate to each other. And you really want to say, but what are those numbers about? You know, is there ultimately some yeah. fire out there, some yeah. consciousness, some stuff that this is measuring? Well, that's one view. There's something out there that all this stuff is talking about. But another view, a more radical view, is it's all, reality is mathematical. There's no, more there's no more nature to reality than these, this certain mathematical structure, informational relations among bits, among parameters. And we ask, what are those parameters measuring? What's the underlying reality? The answer is, that's the wrong question. All there really is is a mathematical flux. Yeah. I'm not sure I can make sense yeah. of that world. It seems to be a world that's ultimately insubstantial. Yeah. You know, it doesn't have enough reality to it. But on the other hand, maybe that's just a outdated, outmoded <laughs> classical intuition, and we ought to embrace our new mathematical world. You've looked at the idea that this whole reality of ours may be a fake, a simulation. And if that were the case, then that would surely be some informational uh, component to that kind of world. Does that, does that kind of fun experience help us to discern what our world could really be like? There's this wonderful convergence between the idea that physics is ultimately grounded in information and this idea that we might live in a computer simulation. Because after all, if we live in a computer simulation, what's actually causing my experiences, the, uh, you know, the atoms, the chairs, the tables out there, they're ultimately made of computational processes, of bits, just as they are on the informational view of physics. So I've often thought that if we are in a computer simulation, this should be taken to vindicate some element of the it from bit view. Underneath particles are patterns of bits. Of course, if it's all a computer simulation in the next level up, then there's going to be something even further underneath the bits. <laughs> you know, the computer in the next universe that it was programmed on and so on ad infinitum. So maybe if that's the way to go, it doesn't stop at the bits. But if it is possible to simulate this world with pure information through that mind experiment that it might be a simulation, that would at least suggest that the idea is not wholly inappropriate in, in trying to, to design a, a reality wholly based on information. Right. Take the idea that it's all a computer simulation. In the first version of that idea, that computer simulation is running on an underlying computer made of some stuff. But now we say stop. 
at the level of the computer simulation. Stop at the bits. Stop at the information. Our world is ultimately an algorithm, and that's the fundamental nature of the world. The algorithm doesn't need to be running on an underlying computer. That is the fundamental nature of our world. It's a mind-boggling idea, to be honest. But, you know, maybe it's the way the world could be. What do you really think about it? I don't know the ultimate nature of our world. It wouldn't surprise me if our world goes down levels, levels beyond levels beyond anything that we currently come to grips. So it wouldn't surprise me if our world is ultimately algorithmic, is partly algorithmic underneath physics. But then, you know, does it stop there? I wouldn't be confident that it stops there. I think we're probably there's going to be even there's going to be layers even deeper down. But in trying to discern what existence is and realities, we're, we're multiplying entities. I mean, obviously we have to do something because uh, we, we, we must go to atoms and sub particles and forces and something beneath the atoms to make the standard model of particle physics make sense because it, we, nobody really believes that the standard model is the ultimate reality. This doesn't involve gravity and relativity and it, it, it's there are too many parameters that have to be fixed by experiment, so it, it's not yet there. But to go continue to go down, uh, it, it seems like a joke. It's been the history of science, you know, whenever we think we get to the fundamental level, we go down a level. What triggers you to go down a level? What makes you go down a level? It's when the previously fundamental level becomes too complex, too yeah. unified. We're discovering this right now, you know, with the particle zoo, with the complications for the various standard theories, for the reconciliation of quantum mechanics and general relativity. You know, we're finding all the anomalies that in previous eras of physics have led us to go down a level. You know, some people think string theory is going to help. Other people are very skeptical. I think we're getting all the signs, though, that say at least we're not yet there. And, of course, the advantage of going down a level is in simplicity. Of the underlying level might help us explain this complexity at the next level up. I'm going to tell you something that I know you know. And that is that most physicists, many of the top physicists, would think that philosophers have absolutely no role to play in this story. Physics is obviously the domain of the physicist, but the philosopher is the person who says, what does this actually mean? The physicist will come up with the equations and say, what are the right equations? Oh, look, I'm not going to interfere with the physicist. The physicist can tell us what the equations are. But then the, phys the physicist tells us, here is what those equations are ultimately saying about the nature of reality. They've started to do philosophy. And I'm not saying that physicists can't do philosophy, but when they're doing it, they're doing the same kind of thing that I do, that a philosopher does. They would say they're not doing philosophy, they're extending their physics, and when they start doing philosophy is when they would go wrong, and they want to keep all other philosophers out of extending their physics, because once philosophers get involved, they mess it up with metaphysics, and metaphysics takes us into whole other realms and uncertainties, and, 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 and messes up people's uh, 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 way of dealing with the real physics. If all you want from your physics is a set of equations, then fine, I mean, you can leave it there. I think some people call this the Copenhagen interpretation of quantum mechanics. They said, just shut up and calculate, <laughs> you know, just get the equations. But if you want something more from your physics, and many physicists have talked this way, they want to say it's actually told us about the fundamental nature of reality. You have to go beyond the equations. You have to interpret them. And this, came, this comes into quantum mechanics. Almost nobody is satisfied with the pure equations of quantum mechanics. They want to say, how does this make sense? What does this actually tell us about the nature of reality? And if the physicist wants to take a step beyond the equations, then they are ultimately doing philosophy. So, you know, there's no avoiding it if you really want to, fi want to figure out what the ultimate nature of reality really is.